And amen, amen. Well, let me pray, and we're going to dive into our final session of Greater Grace series. Father, you are so good, and we love you. We thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you in song, worship you as we fellowship with each other. We thank you, Father, now for the privilege we have to open up the Word of God and hear not a collection of words that you have given to a preacher, but, Father, that you would speak to every child every one of your children here today, online, in person, weeks after we've preached this and they're watching on YouTube. God, we thank you that you have a specific word to give to us and to encourage our hearts here today. We ask that you go before us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, Nikki is not here today. Uh, She's a bit exhausted and needed a, a Sabbath day to rest. So she's at home today. But uh, we are celebrating 17 years of marriage today. Praise the Lord for his goodness. Um, I've had a few of you, uh, especially Miss Bobby said, about 50 more years and you'll catch up to how many years I had. Uh, And amen, it's such an incredible blessing. And uh, Nikki and I, we have this uh, kind of unsaid value in our home that we try to do as much as we possibly can together. So if we go to a doctor's appointment, we're going together. When we drop off gay, pick up gay from school, we're doing it together. You know, uh, as much as we possibly can to do something together, we will do together. And one of my favorite things to do, believe it or not, is picking up my son from school. Because we're one of those weirdos that gets there really early so that we can be closer to the front of the line. So that means we have about 20 to 30 minutes of time to kill. And normally we'll bring a book to read or we'll, we'll have something to discuss and chat about or uh, I bring my laptop to do some work. But what I've really enjoyed doing is I have a collection of funny and viral videos that are stored on my phone. So I'll put it up on our little stand and our dashboard, and we'll take 10 to 15 minutes and just laugh our butts off at some of these viral videos. It's turned almost into like a daily date with my wife, and I absolutely love that time where we can just block out work, block out responsibilities, and just sit in a car in a waiting line and laugh. And recently, my favorite videos, uh, other than dog videos, dog videos are always priority and top, but Some of my favorite videos have been overconfident kids. I don't know if you've seen some of these videos, and I should have had a collection here this morning to show us, but I I didn't. One of them is this little boy who goes to Bucky's, and you know at Bucky's you can custom make a burrito or, you know, whatever sandwich you want to make, and he's maybe five years old, and he wanted to order his own. He wanted to do it all by himself. You know how little kids are like that, I want to do it by myself. And the dad's like, let me help you. It could be confusing. I want to do it by myself. So he goes to town and he sets up his burger. Then his dad has a a camera and he puts it on selfie mode recording. He's like, why don't you show the world what you got? I hope you enjoy your mushroom jalapeno burger. (laughs) And that's all he put on it, you know? And so he's sitting there sad because everybody else is eating brisket and cheeseburgers and he's stuck with jalapenos and mushrooms with nothing else on it. Or the one of the little girls, she has a red onion that she swears is an apple. And the mom says, that's not an apple, honey. That's an onion. And she's like, no, it's an apple. She takes a big old bite. Now, this little kid is too prideful to admit her mistake. So she's like, "Mm, it's good. And she's got tears flowing down. And she takes another bite. I'm like, oh, my pride starts in them young. And then finally, I saw this one this past week. This little girl, she's maybe three years old, three or four years old. And she comes up to her mom with an apple cider vinegar bottle, the extra large one. It's like, mom, juice, juice, juice. It's like, no, it's not apple juice. It's medicine. It's not apple juice. It's medicine. It's not medicine. It's juice. I want you. And she was throwing a fit. So the mom, being a good mom, said, fine. Gets a nice big cup, pours that apple cider vinegar, and gives it to her. Might as well have given that girl whiskey because she was sitting there, like, yeah, smooth, huh? I mean, she, she looked as if, like, you, you just killed her puppy, the face that was on her. It was the saddest thing. But it's this overconfidence. And, and today, I want to talk about confidence. I want to talk about being a confident believer because I do believe that it's unhealthy to be insecure. It's unhealthy to not know who you are. It's unhealthy at times to navigate this life fearful and and timid when we have the creator of the universe as our God. But at the same time, we don't want to be overconfident. 
And I'm not trying to preach today a message in which we can find some happy little balance. What I'm trying to say is we need to remove all the confidence we have in the flesh and put a thousand percent of our confidence in our God because he is faithful and we can rely on him. So today I want to focus on a confidence that's not of ourselves, but a confidence that we find in God. And we are concluding the series Greater Grace today. Over the last four weeks, we've really been expounding on what the gift of grace really looks like. And if you haven't been with us for a while, let me catch you up to speed real fast. In week one, we defined what grace was. And grace is the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor of God. And then, of course, I have my own personal definition, and I pray that you would work out definitions of the things of God in your own heart, not rely on a textbook or or commentaries, but from you and God to find your own statements. And so my statement for the grace of God is that it's everything that Jesus purchased for us on the cross, and it was freely given to us, not of works. So we defined what grace was. Then the following week, we looked at righteousness because grace transforms us. What grace in this beautiful gift of grace did was turned us from a sinner to a saint. It made us unapproachable to God and then put us in right standing with God. And so because of God's grace, this beautiful gift, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I love that. In in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You go a couple verses later to verse 21, it says, he who had no sin became sin so that you and I can become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it transformed who we are. So since you've been transformed, you've received this amazing gift of grace. You've been transformed into a new creation. You have right standing with God. Your sin is completely hidden. You are completely forgiven, saved, healed, delivered, made prosperous. Now you can stand on faith. So in week three, we looked at what it meant to stand on faith, stand on truth, so that you could obey God, so that you can accomplish the will of God. So we looked at this beautiful gift. We looked at how it transformed us. We looked at our responsibility, what our part was and what God's part is. And today, now that we have all of that, I want to talk about what it looks like to be confident in this truth of what God has done in and through us. Martin Luther had a great quote on the confidence of God, and he says, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that the believer would stake his life on it a thousand times. Now, confidence is not the assurance of our ability. Confidence is the assurance of God's faithfulness, bottom line, and we should be confident. As believers, we don't want to be prideful. We don't want to be boastful. We don't want to be braggy, but we want to be confident. If you know who you are in God and you know who your God is and you know what your Savior has done, there should be a boldness. The scriptures tell us that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. So there should be a boldness that that the believer has, much like we've been studying on Wednesday night in the book of Acts. These disciples became bold. They would pray and the ground would shake. They would go out in boldness and preach the word of God, even when they were commanded not to. And they would preach the word of God with boldness. And everybody could tell these untrained, uneducated men had been with Jesus. There was a boldness. And bottom line is, if God calls you to it, he will see you through it. If God has called you to a ministry, if he has called you to witness to a friend, if he has called you to a certain thing, it means he believes you can accomplish it. And you should have the confidence to accomplish the will of God because he is the one who has called you. And there's, there's two real issues when we deal with confidence. And the first one is when we rely too much on ourselves. The second is that when we become boastful. Because I've met a lot of Christians who talk about God in a great way and talk about the power of God, but they can do it in a condemning way. They can do it in a boastful way. They can do it in a way where, well, I walk in the healing power of God and I walk in supernatural ministry and you are not declaring and you are not walking by faith. And isn't it crazy how Christians can be the worst people to each other sometimes? There should be love, bottom line. And this this confidence doesn't come in our own ability, but it comes from this faithfulness that we see in God. But our flesh, it is our flesh. And there's something deep down inside in the flesh 
just like a toddler that just wants to do it on her own, that wants to accomplish it by herself, that doesn't want to do it in community. And there's much about our flesh that says, you know what, I'll go to God when I've exhausted everything else. Prayer and our faith should never be a last resort, should always be a first priority. We should never accomplish the things in our life and give all this effort and energy and do everything we possibly can do and use every resource. And when we have nothing else to do, we say, well, maybe I'll go to God. Maybe you wouldn't have gone through all those trials and those situations if you had gone to God first. It should be a first priority. In the book of Proverbs, I'm going to read this to you. You don't have to turn there. And we should have it up here on the screen. I love this not definition, but just this bold statement of what we can stand upon when it comes to confidence. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 26, it says, For the Lord, the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. So it's not that I have to be confident, it's that the Lord himself is our confidence. If you want to walk in, in the confidence of God, you need to know where the source is coming from. I remember years ago, I, I had an office that was right behind the stage. So just imagine that there was an office behind the stage. And uh, it, during the week, it's really quiet. There's no instruments. There's no people. And it's a great place to study. And I remember one day, uh, I'm sitting there in my office in silence because I'm one of those weirdos. Is there anybody else who can go hours in a car and not need a radio, not need any music? You're lost in your thoughts, and it's just beautiful. I'm one of those people. I work in silence. I drive in silence. My brain has a, a, a storyline going on at all times. Sometimes when my wife is in the front seat, she's, she doesn't want to turn on the radio. I'm like, you're always, if you want to put music on, go ahead. I'm in my own little world, and you're welcome to join me at any time. <laughs> you know, I'm having wonderful adventures in my mind. So I'm sitting there in silence in my office, and I begin to hear this humming. And you know when, like, hear those, hear those fluorescents? I hear something like that, but times 10. So I'm in my office, I'm like, where's that coming from? And then it would shut off. And then a cu couple minutes later, it would come back on again. Sometimes it would last five minutes, sometimes it'd be five hours. I'm like, what is that coming from? I'm checking everything in my office. I go to the other side of the wall, to the other office. I said, do you have like a mini fridge or something against the wall that's causing a hum? It's like, no. So then I come out of my office and I'm, I'm going on stage because sometimes the, the musicians will leave a, a monitor on or something. Maybe there's a hum. There's no fluorescent lights. It was driving me crazy. I was going bananas in my office for days. Finally, one of our maintenance guys walks by and I look at him. His name is Iman, but I call him He-Man because that's how it's spelled. So I said, hey, He-Man, come here. Come here. Do you hear that? And he goes, yeah. I'm like, oh, thank God. I'm not crazy. Awesome. Can you fix that? And so he goes, hmm, hmm, hmm. And then he goes up into the attic and the humming stopped. He came down. I gave him the biggest hug in the world. I said, you are my hero. What was that? And he goes, well, the air-conditioned duct had duct tape around it, and a piece of it had come off. And that's why it would come on for some times and turn off for other times. When the air began to blow, it would vibrate, causing a hum. So he just put a fresh piece of tape around there, and it fixed the problem. I'm like, thank you so much. I now have peace. I had peace because I found where the source of the irritation was. And the same with our confidence. How can we dare to expect to have confidence in this world if we don't know where the source of confidence comes from? How, how can we walk in the boldness of God if we have first not encountered the one who brings us that boldness? We will not be confident until we know the source. And when we find the source and when we fellowship with God and when we commune with him, we, we need to let those encounters change the narrative in our hearts. We have to change the narrative. Too many of us are, are declaring things that just go against what God has declared over our lives. You know, I'm too weak. This is never going to change. Why is this always happening to me? Here it is. That's just my luck. And we constantly say these negative things. Well, the Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And sometimes we have to boldly declare something so that our brains can hear what really is in our spirit. I mean, how did you become a Christian? Since you believed in your heart, you confessed with your mouth. Upon your confession of the faith, you became born again. 
How much more in our daily lives we need to change this narrative to say, God, you are able. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am more than a conqueror. Thank you, God, that I am a saint, not a sinner. Thank you that I have the authority of Christ. Thank you that I'm called a beloved child of God. And you declare these things. And I believe that confidence is birthed out of our devotion with God, but also of our declaration of his faithfulness. When we declare the great things of God, powerful things happen. We have to guard our hearts if we want to walk in confidence. When you look at the Old Testament, you see so many characters in the Bible that bow down to false idols. And we like to judge them a whole lot, don't we? You're like, how could you sit there in this mountain, the Shekinah glory, Moses goes up the mountain, there's thunder and lightning, booming voice from heaven and a dark cloud, the manifest presence of God. And he goes up there to get the Ten Commandments. You ready for a dad joke? First time something from the cloud was ever downloaded on a tablet was with Moses and the Ten Commandments. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so he's up there, Ten Commandments. He can't even get off the mountain before they're like, man, this is taking forever. Can we make another God? And they start melting things down and create this cap. They start bowing down to an idol. But isn't it interesting that the reason so many people bow down to false idols and worship these images is because their fear motivated them to get this from somebody else. So as an example, the false god Baal was the god of abundance. So if you have crops and there's no abundance and you're not able to feed your family and you're crying out to God, but nothing's changing, it's so tempting now to bow down to a false god to say, I want to get what that person is promising to change my situation. And none of us would bow down to an idol, but how many times do we bow down to the systems of this world? How many times do we give in to pressure? How, how many times do we allow our fear to dictate how we are going to live our lives? And I'm, I'm convinced that whatever you fear will determine what you worship, and whatever you worship will determine where your trust is placed. So we can't let our fears guide us. He didn't give us a spirit of fear, as you said, Michelle. He gave us love, power, and a sound mind. And it's up to us to guard that. If we want confidence, we need to know where the source is coming from. We need to guard our hearts, and we need to speak truth in order that we walk in the boldness of God. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read what could sound like a boast from the Apostle Paul in a portion of Scripture where it's something that should be written on the memory of our heart and something that we should be declaring quite often. We're going to go in chapter 3, verse 4, and we're going to end at verse 9. Just a few verses here. The Apostle Paul says, Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. So standing in front of a bunch of people, he's like, oh, okay, you guys want to talk resume? You want to talk accomplishments? You want to talk the best of the best? Let me break it down for you. Verse 5, circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. And so he begins, this, he begins this, uh, this rant, so to say, of his resume by saying, hey, we want to put confidence in the flesh. If anybody has any reason to boast, it's me. But he made this distinguishing line by saying, I'm not going to put my confidence in the flesh. I'm going to be putting my confidence in God alone, the surpassing value of knowing who God is. So where are you placing your confidence is the question. Where are you placing your confidence here today? I, I Heard this cute little story, uh, it began with a tragedy, true story, of a brain surgeon who was taking a stroll in a park, and this little boy on a bike comes flying by him, and he actually crashes headfirst into a tree without a helmet. So the brain surgeon, what a perfect place to be at, at such a horrible time, rushes over to the little boy, he's checking his vitals and so forth, 
out of nowhere, the little boy who crashed had a friend, and the friend came running over to him, and he looks down at him. He looks at the surgeon. He goes, I should probably take over right now. I'm a Boy Scout. He had confidence in who he was. He had confidence in what he accomplished. But we are not called to take confidence in our flesh. We are called to take confidence in God. And something that I discovered in this past week as I just sat and meditated on on these scriptures was, isn't it interesting that no matter what, you're going to put your confidence in something? Bottom line, you'll either put your confidence in yourself, confidence in your God, or confidence in a wrong thing confidence in a world system and politics and something else. But no matter what, you are built to have a confidence in something. Some of you are so confident bad things are going to happen to you. Some of you are so confident that the economy is going to crash and we're all going to burn and die. Some of us are confident in God. Some of us are confident in our accomplishments, but you are going to be confident in something, period. And we need to be disciplined to stand on the word of God so that our confidence naturally falls on his faithfulness, not on our abilities or what this crazy world is trying to bring about in us. Let me read to you one final verse here, and you don't have to turn there, um, and it'll be up here on the screens, but Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 through 38. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he strike, shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. So we, we have this, this call, this command, don't toss your confidence away. When the creator of the universe has given you all the spiritual blessings of heaven, when Jesus came down in the flesh into our world and took the punishment that we deserve to give us salvation and life, we can't just live this life the eight to five, the nine to five, the working 48 weeks a year, the American dream, and just toss our faith, toss our confidence aside, say, I'm just going to tolerate life, get through life, but not believe God for the bigger things, not trust that he has a calling on my life, not trust that he has given me authority to accomplish incredible, miraculous things in this world. No matter how small or how big they may be, we can't toss our confidence aside. And so the question that I, 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 I feel in my heart to leave with us is, what is your confidence killer? What in your life, we know the enemy is out there, But what in your life is absolutely robbing your confidence? And to go deeper, what is pulling you from the very presence of God? What's pulling you from intimacy with the Father when Jesus has removed every restraint, every hindrance, every stumbling block from the throne room of God? What is keeping you from confidence? What is the narrative in your mind that is telling you you can't do that? That's telling you you are nothing. That's telling you it's never going to change. What has robbed you of energy? What has robbed you of joy? What has robbed you of hope? There's no place in the Christian heart to have hopelessness when we serve a God who holds the universe in his hand. And I've been meditating for a couple of weeks now on uh, having an offering to bring God in every aspect of life. Because the bottom line is that people will either become traumatized or they will be transformed when tragedy strikes. You're going to have some type of reaction. When bad things, a shooter walks into an office building, when a plane falls out of the sky, when we hear news that a nine-year-old daughter dies, when, when we are fearful of the economy, when bad things happen, it's going to do something to you, and you're either going to be traumatized by it and shut down, or you're going to be transformed by it for the glory of God. And one thing that has brought me so much encouragement in the last couple of weeks is that everything that I do for God and every tragedy that the devil throws my way can be given as an offering. When you live your life as an offering, it's almost impossible to live with suffering. Think about it. Let's say you're on the mission field. You're on the mission field. It's a rainy day. Your car breaks down. You're stranded in the mud for hours. It's freezing cold. You have no food, no water, and you're there suffering. But when you change your perspective and say, God, I offer this time to you, and you turn the worries into worship, when you give yourself as an offering, there's something that changes in you. When you're, you're working for God, sometimes, you know, serving in the church means scrubbing toilets. And I thank you, cleaning crew, who have done that the last couple months. 
Sometimes it means a, a, a church building project. Sometimes it means going to visit somebody in a hospital who's lost their mind and it breaks your heart. So there's a lot that we do in the Christian faith that can feel weary. A lot that we can do for God that, that you think, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy, I don't have the strength anymore to do this. But when everything in your life turns into an offering, there's no more suffering. And it's almost as if there's an energy, there, there is a strength, there is a newfound faith that you can stand upon when you say, God, every aspect of my life is going to be an offering unto you. Think about the confidence that comes into your heart. When he's like, this is my offering to you, God. So I'm giving you my best effort and everything that I do here is gonna be an offering for you. And you can do that with boldness and you can do that with confidence because it's not about the assurance of your abilities. It's on the assurance of his faithfulness. Well, Father, thank you for your goodness here today. And we thank you for the word of God. And I thank you, Lord, that even in this world of craziness and, and the world that seems to be getting further and further and further away from you, we can still stand on hope and on confidence, because we trust in a God who holds the world in his hands. We love you today, God, and I pray that in the preaching of the word and the studying of the scriptures, that hearts today would have a different perspective and looking to you, Father, and to trusting in you with a greater sense of urgency to walk in boldness. We thank you for what today represents the, the time to worship you, to preach the word, and then now to spend the next several moments enjoying a meal together, fellowshipping, talking about the things of God like the first church did in the book of Acts. So we love you and we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for an incredible church family. And we ask now that your presence and your joy be felt in our afternoon and as we begin a new week. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.